One of the things we're trying to foster at the branch is revival culture. And, uh, and in revival culture, one of the things I've seen, I've had the opportunity to hang out with this guy named Randy Clark for a, a dozen or so more years, got my doctor with him, and this guy named Roland Baker, is, uh, is just the, the, the impartation and laying on the hands for power. Does that make sense to you at all? And Hebrews chapter 6, that's where I'm going to be talking to you, Then we're going to talk to you about doing it again. But I'm going to talk to you these next two weeks, I'm going to talk about the laying on of hands, and not just baptism, because a lot of times we think about baptism, we think about water baptism, but the word we're going to read in Hebrews chapter 6, are, there's more than one kind of baptism. There's a baptism of fire, there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit, and yeah, there's the dunk and plunge kind of baptism, we talk about water baptism. So if you got your Bible, slip over to Hebrews chapter 6, that's where we'll be in tonight. And Paul's going to say this, and he's going to give us like six primary teachings of the early church. And so let me roll through that for you. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrines. Can we just say elementary doctrines? <laughs> elementary doctrines like, hey, man, this is like, this is Christianity 101 in the early church. Like, this is what we talk. We're talking to you guys about it all the time. I get that as a pastor because there's so many times I'm like, I'm talking and talking. And I was like, I've taught the five-step prayer model so many times in my life. If you don't know what that is, get the series, get the tape. All of our people go through that. It's something that John Wimber had. But if, if, how many people want to see more healings, right? We have healing rooms here that Christina uh, uh, operates. She will go through, and you can go through like a half-day training. So you'll be proficient in seeing your miracles and healings going up. Because I used to just go like, Lord, if that's your will, I just pray amen. You know, it's kind of like a quick prayer. But I know like I was just got back from Brazil, and I prayed for a lady born deaf. And it was like I was praying maybe an hour and a half for her, and then she started to hear, right? Could we, in Mark chapter 8, Jesus prays for a blind guy, and he goes, what do you see? And, and the blind man says, I see men that look like trees. Well, that's not healed. Are you with me on that? That's still kind of like, oh, I can't see clearly. Prays again, and his, his, his sight clears up. So sometimes we get that thing of like, I'm just going to pray, but there's something about tearing. Has, has anybody ever heard the word tarry? You know, it's kind of that acrostic push, praying until something happens. But I'm praying for this lady maybe an hour and a half, born deaf, and so I got a a translator from Portuguese to a sign person doing the sign thing to her. And, and as she's talking, you can see the presence of the Lord. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I can see the glory of God just coming upon her. And I'm going, ask her what she's experiencing right now. And she's doing all this down the line. And she's like, she's seeing angels right now. I'm like, well, that's a good indicator. Are you with me? Like praying, she's got angels. or she's seeing angels, that's pretty cool. And I started to pray for her. And I got like right behind her. And I go, now I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to snap my finger, and if you can hear me from behind, I want you to lift a finger up out of what ear you can hear it. So I'm like, and she's like this, and I'm like, like that. And I got like from here all the way back to where that wall is, and I'm like this, and she's like this, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Now, I can't even hear that good at 65, right? We're like, what, what, what? <laughs> Are you with me on that? So we're going to talk about these doctrines. Let us leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and go on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, and of faith toward God, and now of instructions about washing, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So the writer of Hebrews, and some people think it's Paul, some people think it's, it's Barnabas, I'm going to say it's Paul, but these are primary doctrines. These are teachings that they would train you up and go, what do I need to do to go out and minister? And like these six things are foundational to the church, right? And so I'm going to talk to you today about laying on our hands. Next week, I'm going to get more into baptisms. And we're going to pray that you get a baptism of fire, that if you have already been baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Bible says be filled. It's not like, oh, yeah, I was filled back in 1978. It means continue to be filled. We're kind of like leaky. Are, you know what I mean? We're kind of leaky. And so it's like, what happened? You know, I'm dried up. Because God's saying, hey, there's more. There's a river of God that you can probably up to. And Ezekiel's going to prophesy about that. Like, it was in the river of God. And and it wasn't just ankle deep or knee deep or waist deep. It was so deep, I couldn't even maintain it. And that's the kind of flow and river we want to be in. Where David says, I'll be even more undignified than this. You know, when the Lord shows up, it gets a little undignified. Right? Are you with me? They're like, oh, Lord, bless me. And you're shaking. You're falling on the ground. Right? It's like, what's up with that? Because that's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, that it's like, we always like, well, the Holy Spirit's a gentleman. Well, tell that to Ananias and Sapphira. Are you with me on that? 
You know, you, you, like when the Holy Spirit shows up historically, there's effects of the Holy Spirit. That's in 1 Corinthians 12. There's a variety of ministry, variety of gifts, and a variety of effects. So effects of the Holy Spirit, energia is a Greek word, the energies of God. It's like when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, right? Jesus, they're coming to get Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and he goes, I am, he's like, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he goes, I am he. And everybody just falls back. Is that cool? Like we call it slain in the spirit. Like Jesus is like, that's me, right? You're like, you can't even stand in my presence. And so sometimes the Holy Spirit shows up, and you get wobbly, and you fall, and sometimes you shake. Well, there was a group in the early 1600s, and they're called the Quakers, because they just go, come Holy Spirit, and they start to shake. You thought they called them the Quakers because they invented oatmeal. No, that's not true, okay? <laughs> and the Quakers and the Shakers, and the Shakers were kind of like Elvis, like, uh-huh, <laughs> we're all shook up, okay? So these six primary doctrines, so let me go through it. Repentance, right? repentance from dead works so he's got hey like it's not your works it's by faith through grace like should anybody boast and you have all these people how many people every people like if i just work harder he'll like me more right that's works orientation like you have been made righteous by his blood that's faith like we can boldly come into his presence hebrews says by his blood and ephesians said we're seated with him in heavenly places now, that, that's not a feeling or an emotion, but no sin can come for the presence of God, and you're seated with him in heavenly places. So what's my point on that? The devil is a liar. Yeah. Who do you think you are? You think you're righteous. I am righteous because God called me through his blood, and when we have the blood of Jesus on our lives, we are in right standing. So Paul's going to say, hey, listen, there's repentance from dead works, because works don't get you to heaven but your faith is going to have works. That's the book of James, right? Like, you say you have faith, well, then you're going to do the stuff. Are you with me on that? But you're not saved by your works, okay? But your, your works are going to show. Like, you, it, let me put it another way. You do what, you act upon what you believe. You act upon what you believe. So there is a period of time, and we're in Montana, and I made the mistake of telling people around Christmas time how much I like fudge. I like homemade fudge, okay? And I'm getting containers of fudge. Not just, oh, here, pastor. They're giving me like five pounds of fudge. And I was eating fudge. I was like on the fudge diet. And then I got on the scale. I'm like, oh, I think I'm putting on a little weight. My jeans are tough. Robin, you put my jeans in the dryer for too long. Then I got on the scale and it said one person at a time. I knew I was in trouble, right? <laughs> then I figured out you are what you eat. You know, it got so bad. I was taking fudge and microwaving it and pouring it on haagen ice cream. <laughs> Oh, taste and see the Lord is good. That's what I'm saying. It, it was good, but that probably wasn't a good thing. So then the second doctrine is faith towards God. And this, this act of like we are dependent and we trust and our trust is relying on God. Do you ever do any like team exercises, any business people here or like you're in a youth group and you do these team exercises and they're like, just relax, I'm right here behind you. This is what we practice with our catchers, right? Like they haven't put a finger on your back because I'm here, I catch you. It's always a psych when there's no one behind you and you're like, oh yeah, I try to, and you fall off the thing, okay? Faith towards God is like, Lord, here I am, catch me. Here I am, catch me. And so that's faith towards God. Baptisms. And so you don't hear a lot about baptism. We talk about repent, be baptized, and you need to do that if you've never been water baptized. But there's also a baptism of fire and a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we talk about baptisms. Probably the best way to see this is Elijah and Elisha. If you ever have trouble remembering, J comes before us. And Elijah says, Elijah, you just follow me and I'm gonna, you're going to get my mantle. And Elijah tosses his mantle and Elijah picks it up. And he puts it on, and he has double the power. So some people say, that's a Christophany. That's a representative of Jesus giving his power to the church. And so, and so what's the point of that? The Lord's saying, greater things shall you do. John 14, 12, greater things shall you do. Do you guys, do you guys believe that? Yep. Like, how many people want to see more dead people raised? I've only prayed for two dead people. I had a 9 o'clock service in Montana. I jokingly said I raised three or 400 people every, nine, every Sunday at 9 o'clock, Okay. So, God, we're going to see greater things. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming into one of the most epic revivals known to mankind, right? Now, is there a lot of warfare going on? Heck yes. 
right? So be encouraged, right? There's baptisms. And then he's going to talk about the laying on of hands. I'll talk to you tonight about that and the resurrection of the dead. My dad is 92. My dad loves the Lord. My dad is so funny. Like, my mom just passed away. And my dad, had, he's had strokes. So th- my dad has one of those walkers. You should see my dad cook. Because my dad, for 65 years, would cook my mom breakfast. But after strokes and stuff like that, he still wants to cook her breakfast. So this is what my dad does. He's sitting in this, like, walker chair. You know, he has the walker chair. He goes up to the refrigerator, opens the door at Christmas time. So at my Christmas time, my parents get this thing called honey-baked ham, Okay. And he takes a slice of honey baked ham and puts it right where his butt was sitting and walks over and walks over. I'm like, well, that is love. <laughs> that has some secret sauce on it. <laughs> and my dad, since my mom passed away, then my dad does the same routine, two eggs, piece of toast. I don't know how much coffee he drinks. He reads the LA Times and then he reads his New Testament. My dad loves the Lord. And then my dad asked me, called me up the other day and he goes, so Nick, what? Because he's getting close, right? He's, he's, on the, he's been to the top of the mountain. Now he's looking, and he wants to be with the Lord. And he goes, so what happens when we die? We're talking resurrection of the dead, right? Well, Dad, the, Bi- the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, you guys know Holly Yingling, her, her mom. Had, I went out and saw her mom at UNC. Her mom had flatlined. Her mom had died for five minutes, and they resuscitated her. So I was out there right after they resuscitated her, and she goes, I don't want to be back here. She goes, I, I've been in heaven. Like, it's amazing. And I could see the glory of God on her face. Like, she was lighting up, man. She was like, whoa, glory on her face. You know, turn the lights out because she is going to be like a glow worm, right? She says, glow it. She goes, I was there. I don't want to go back. And that, oh, my gosh, Nick. And, and I'm like taking notes. Like, tell me more. How was it? Pray for me. I get some of that glory on my life, right? So the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's what happens, right? So when the Bible says, death, where is your sting? All these other things, like, like what's the fear of death? Like, you get majorly upgraded. Now, think about this. In heaven, there is no sun and there is no moon. You got, remember reading that in Revelations? Why is that? Because right now, anything, this is a world dimly. It's kind of like the matrix, right? So where do we get, our, where do we get the light from? It, the light's are coming out of the sun when the moon is a reflection of that. Why is, there no, why is there no moon and sun in heaven? Because he is the light that illuminates. If we, it's not going to be some man-made artificial thing up there, God-made thing. It's going to be, you're going to be in the glory of God. You're going to have light switches on because the light will be with you. And this is just a side note because I read too much. But I've read about people's experiences and they go, the light in heaven, it was, like, it was like living. It was like radiant upon me as I stood before the Lord. I'm like, yeah, because he's shining on you. Is that, is that so? We always talk about, oh, heaven, oh, how boring. You know, you're going to be on a cloud, you know, shooting little angels. We'll, here, Will, you're going to be in heaven and you're going to get floored. The Bible says no eye has seen, no ear has heard. Like, you're going to get so blown away. Like, oh, my gosh. I don't want to come back. Give me back all the accounts of people that I know that have been dead and been resuscitated. They are like, you know, I don't want to go back there. Like, I want to go back there. I had a friend of mine in Southern California, and his dad, major Uber pastor, I don't know how many people, and he's in hospice, and they have worship music playing. And he passes. He does it like three times. The first time he passes, he goes, I was just in the presence of God. There's four pastors in the room, four pastors in the room, right? So like, Dad, what was it like? Because they're going to get their best preaching material that they've ever had. So tell us what was it like. And oh, my gosh, he does that like three times. Third time he goes, I, and they got worship music going on and all this other stuff. And he goes, they, he goes, I was just in heaven and I was with Jesus. And he told me you are going to be with me pretty soon. Oh, awesome, Dad, thanks. He goes, but can you do me a favor? Like, Dad, sure, anything. Can you turn the worship music off that you have playing here? Because it's so much better on the other side. The resurrection of the dead. is whoo. So the resurrection of the dead is, so he's coming back and all these bodies are coming out because you get a new body. And, and, and So for all the people that are over 50 in this room, be encouraged. Because everybody accounted wasn't like, oh, yeah, he gave you a 50-year-old body. He's going to give you like a 25-year-old, like, whoa, body again. <laughs> and what does that look like? Well, we see it with Jesus. Like, he, he doesn't knock on the doors. He just, like, walks through, right? Yeah, right? 
He's like, oh, I got to be here. Oof, you go because it's outside of time, space, and matter, which are created like, wow, you're going you're to judge angels, which I want to talk to my angels. Like, well, we need some more angels in this place. Are you with me on that? Resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And so the lake of fire and what happens for those. That's why we evangelize, by the way, right? There is a heaven. It is real. There is a hell. And there, there will be eternal judgment. Everything we do here, right? Too much is given, much is required. There'll come a day. It's like, what did you do with me? Right? Like, what did you do with me? Bob Jones. Anybody remember Bob Jones? The crazy nut, nut, nutty prophet, right? And so Bob dies. I was with his wife, Bonnie. She came to Montana. We sat there for two hours and just talked. And she's talking to me about Bob. And Bob had passed away. And he's in a line in heaven. And there's this giant heart. And this is what Bob experienced. And I'm not saying this is biblical. This is extra biblical. But he's waiting in line. And, and going in the heart of Jesus. And Jesus was asking everybody a few questions. Right? How well did you love me? And how well did you love other people? And so the lady in front of him, he could hear the Lord saying, I know you love me. But you really didn't love other people well. It's easy to love those who like you. Isn't that the whole thing about love? Like, you know, no, what credit is it to you if you love those who are like you, right? But rather, so isn't it awesome? Anybody have somebody in your life that you're challenged to love? Robin's like, yeah, that's you, Nick. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. <laughs> that's maturity, right? That's spiritual maturity. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. I love the gifts. But listen, the gifts are only for earth, right? Gifts of healings, miracles, and all that. That's just for earth that we can attest to who he is. But you get to heaven, the fruit remains, right? Anybody remember that old, because I'm old, right? There used to be a, a Burger King commercial. Remember that? Where's the beef? Remember that? Yeah, where's the beef? Like, geez, right? I think the Lord's going to be like, where's the fruit? <laughs> you got like this little piece of fruit in here, right? So, all right. So mature people know the fruit of these doctrines. The mature people know these doctrines, elementary teachings, and they don't just intellectually know them mature people practice them right it's one thing to be hearers but it's another thing to implement it right remember p90x anybody remember p90x i got to tell you when p90x and this is like this workout thing and i was in southern california and i go man i want to do p90x and somebody gave me the dvds for p90x it was really cool i had those dvds for three months and, and nothing happened Maybe I should have put it in the DVD player. I don't know. <laughs> and the same with the words. Like, man, I know it, I have it, but unless you implement it, right? So maturity is not measured by age. It's an attitude built by experience. And maturity is when you live your life by your commitments, not your feelings, right? Ben talked about this last week. And that, did you guys enjoy Ben last week? He did a great job, right? But as was Jesus' custom, he went to the synagogue. Like, no one told Jesus, you got to go to church. Jesus, it was his custom, right? I love you guys. You guys give up a Saturday night to come, to come and I think it's for the more of God. I think it's possibly, it's like, when's he going to just, like, rend the heavens and blow up and come into Raleigh? Like, I wouldn't want to miss that day. Like, like oh, my gosh, it's here. <laughs> I remember 1994 when the, the, like, like the outpouring hit Southern California, like unprecedented. Like you can't make that up. Like you can't make the glory of God up. You have to experience that, right? When the Bible says taste and see the Lord is good, you know, it's like you taste that. You're like, oh, that was really good. You know, like I'm from Southern California, so everybody brags about their Mexican food. It's like you haven't tasted and seen what the real stuff's like. <laughs> And he, right, amen, right, amen, amen. The Californians are like, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. It's not Taco Bell. Maturity, maturity is when you stop making excuses and start making progress. Albert Einstein said this. I thought it was good. I live in that solitude, which is painful in youth, but delicious in the years of maturity. So what, what is he saying is this. Like discipline for the moment of time, and discipline is doing the thing that no one else wants to do, to have the results no one else has. When you're in that discipline of the time, it's not fun. But when you go through it later on, you're like, whoo, that is good, because I, I sought the Lord. I can now. So, anyways, so this is normative biblical teaching to the early church. It's foundational. The laying on of hands. And we don't hear a lot about laying on of hands. Anybody been to Bible college or anything? 
right? Anybody have a class on laying hands 101, right? Why do we lay hands on people? Well, 1 Timothy 4, 14 and 15 says this. Do not neglect the gift you have. So neglect is you, you, like, like the P90X, like you're never using it, right? With gifts, I believe it's like this. It's like, I just, you guys know, I just tore my Achilles tendon and I had to have it reattached. And they put me in a boot for three months. Now my legs are not that sexy, okay? I got some pretty skinny, like chicken looking legs, okay? <laughs> And after three months, it was pretty sad. Like, they took the book, I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, I got chicken bird legs. Like, I look like the stick man. <laughs> I got stick man bird, like, legs, right? Well, what happened? I atrophied. And there's something about the gifts, if we neglect, we atrophy. Something about using them that they get fine-tuned up, right? Don't neglect the gift which was given to you by prophecy when the council of the elders laid hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. So what, it, what is the saying is this. How many people want to grow in the gifts? How many people want to see more healings? You know what that requires? That requires you to pray for people. And, and you know what's really like the, the gift of faith has this. It all requires faith. It requires risk. And so, and you can't heal anybody, right? You can't. It's the power of Christ in us coming through us that I believe is motivated by love, right? But don't get your identity and like, oh, yeah, I saw this person healed, right? It becomes an idol. The gift can become on idols, especially like in prophetic community. I live like in prophetic community. It's like, it's almost like accuracy is everything, right? Does that make sense to you? It's like, how accurate are you? Like, who cares? That's, my motivation for prophesying is not how accurate I am. My motivation for giving somebody a prophetic word is he's real and he knows you. And he actually loves you. Because so many people are out in the streets and we go out every Saturday pretty much. There's people like, God doesn't like me. God can't like me. And no, not only is he like you, like he created you. He loves you, right? So practice yourself. Paul, 2 Timothy 1, 6, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. So fan into flames. I just got back from Glacier National Park. I hiked a week with these 20-year-old kids. That was epic, okay? Going on a 10-mile hike with these kids up a mountain, I'm, and they're 20 years old. And I, I just happened to get blessed. I, like, I got in the head of the, of the line, you know, going up the mountain, and everybody's like, I want to be like you when I'm 65 years old. I'm like, hey, that was divine intervention. Like the Lord put me the head of the line. Like I'm not some mountaineer. Are you with me on that? So we, we <laughs> this reason to fan into flames. When we were camping, they, we had classes, outdooring classes, and they showed us how to make fire, which I thought like, you know, you get a match, you throw some gasoline on it, that's how you make a fire, <laughs> right? Or, 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 or lighter fluid, match, that's all you need, right? That's in my world, okay? But they're showing us, like, you take the wood and you baton it and you split the wood and it, you do these little curly things and then you get the little curly things. I'm probably all the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts are like, yeah, that's basic. But I didn't know this. So they're chopping it up and then they, they, they light a match and then they're, they're blowing on it. And they're fanning into flame that thing that was just a spark. We're required to take the spark that God's given us, and come on, more, Lord, more, fan it into flame. And Paul will tell Timothy, in 1 Timothy, don't neglect, take pains. And they'll say in 2 Timothy, hey, remember that gift? Like, start fanning it, man. Start letting, start letting my breath come upon it, okay? Because I, like, when I talk about laying on a hands, 12 years ago, Randy Clark laid hands on me. I had seen miracles, okay? But then it went from, like, seeing miracles, like, oh, yeah, we're seeing miracles every month, to, like, what happened last week? Right? Like we look and go, man, last week we saw, last week I saw Linda Peters. I got a thing in my, I got a somewhere in my Bible here. I keep it. This Marlboro rancher lady who had stage four cancer. Here it is right here, man. This is so cool. Karen, Karen Peterson just left the doctor. She had already had a lung removed because of cancer. And now her other lung has cancer in it. So that, that's not good. Are you with me on that? So her whole lung is black. And we prayed for it, right? Her cancer is in remission. It was stage four, very violent. Did MRI and CT, it's dying away. It went from her whole lung is black to the next day it was the size of a pea and completely gone. That's kind of cool, isn't it? 
And that lady was tough. Like, you, this, like, Montana rancher lady, like, you shook her hands. Like, her hands had, her ca- had, like, she had, like, ballistic calluses. You know what I mean? Like, anybody got any sandpaper? Just take Linda's hand. And just, like, <laughs> I need a facial. <laughs> right? So Paul's going to remind. So if Timothy had to be reminded, I think that, that applies to my life, right? It has to be on my radar, right? Because if it's not on your radar, it starts to neglect. I don't know what neglect looks on your house. In my house, in Robin and I bathrooms, we have two sinks. I like having two sinks. Because in Montana, with five daughters, we had two bathrooms and with five girls, one shower, two showers is all we had with five girls. Oh, my God. Like, you had a plan, okay? <laughs> but now, we live in Cary, and it's bougie, right? We got like, hey, we, got, we each got our own sink. And my wife had, had the gall to tell me, have you looked at your sink? I'm like, <laughs> not really. <laughs> What's wrong with my sink? You're like... You got shaving cream caked up in it. I'm like, didn't notice. <laughs> I had neglected cleaning my sink, and she was right. There was some really good soap scum in that thing. So, so what should ministry look like, right? Repentance and salvation are awesome, but also this healing and divine appointments, right? So when I talk about repentance and salvation as a doctrine, then maybe perhaps the Lord in this walk about laying on our hands, maybe the Lord has something for us that's not on our radar. I believe that the Bible says the steps of a righteous person are ordered by God. Do you guys believe that? That he's the alpha and omega. And he says, before you were born, I knew you. Now, I want you to, uh, let's, let's rewind on that. Before you were born, I knew you. And he's Alpha and Omega. So that means that this, if we're walking in the Spirit, if we're walking in the Spirit, then God has orchestrated things in our lives. Are you looking for them? Does that make sense to you? Because a lot of times we're like, okay, wake up, go, go, go. And we're like, we pass these divine appointments. And what I mean by divine appointments are something, a supernatural encounter that God has in store for you that doesn't have to be like once a year, but it can be daily. right? And God puts those people before you all the time. I think I told you during COVID, I was really frustrated because I'm like, Lord, there's nobody to pray for. And the Lord spoke to me. He goes, Nick, you pass non-people every day. I'm like, what do you mean non-people? You go to that same Exxon station on Old Apex and Cary Parkway, and you don't know their names. And I'm like, I started crying. I'm like, you're right. I don't know them. They become non-people to me. So I walked in. I started prophesying with God. Hey, what's up? I'm Nick. The Lord's telling me you're from Ethiopia. He goes, I'm from Ethiopia. And then you're a believer. He goes, I am a believer. And today you're praying that, Lord, no one notices you. But the Lord brought me in here to tell you that he knows and he heard your prayers. And the next time I went in, he grabs his coworker and goes, this is the guy who's told me all about my life. Like it was almost like New Testament, right? <laughs> like New Testament is like, you know, chapter one. Like New Testament, I believe, is like how we should be living our lives. So here's the story, Jesus and Nathaniel, right? John 1, 48, Jesus is calling the disciples. And, and this is what you get all the time when you're on the streets. You're like, how do you know that? And so this is what Nathaniel says. How do you know about me? How do you know about me? This is what the prophetic does. And Nathaniel asked, Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Now, why am I sharing that story? Because Jesus saw Philip had a divine appointment, saw where he was, and what was the fruit of that? It led Nathaniel to go, I'm, I'm following this guy. And isn't it amazing, too, like when all the disciples are called, what do they do? Like, can I have some time to pray about this? I need to raise some support. You know, I'm leaving my dad's fishing business, you know. They left it, and so I'm following you. I'm just saying, possibly there's a cost. So we all like, well, that's really cool. Now, now they got to live by faith, which is really cool, by the way, how God provided. Go fishing, okay? We don't have any, we don't have any money for taxes. Give to Caesar, thanks Caesars. Go fish. Peter goes fish. What comes out of him? A gold coin. That's awesome. Because now we can fish and get finance in the same, same boat. I like that idea, right? Power encounters is how Jesus operated. Jesus was about his father's business. He came to seek and to save the lost, to destroy the works of the, of the devil. And Philip is going to have that same encounter. Let me read this to you in Acts 8. Now, the angel of the Lord said to Philip. So who's speaking to Philip? An angel. 
hey, are angels real? Yes. I can show you pictures on my phone. Like I, I left my phone downstairs because my phone's a distraction, okay? But I can show you pictures on my phone of a, a friend of mine, Bruce Oh, Bruce Allen, he's a guy, pastor in Spokane. He's in Malaysia. And the, all these guys are just sitting there praying, and they took a picture. And in the picture is this gigantic angel, and his arms are crossed like this. It's really cool, right? So we need to get this. The angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down to Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and he went. And there an Ethiopian, a eunuch, official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. Historically, we know revival broke out in Ethiopia. As a result, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church was started by this encounter. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. So this guy was a follower of the Lord, this eunuch, and was returning seated in his chariot and was reading the prophet Isaiah. And, it said, it said to the, and the Spirit said to Philip, go over and join his chariot. What does that look in the real world? The Spirit said to go do that. The Lord highlighted him to him. Do you know what I mean by highlight? You have a strong urge. You have a strong sense. Like, I got to go pray for that person, Right? And so when the Lord nudges your heart like that, what do you do? Get in the chariot, right? Like, okay, I don't know how this is going to go. This might be awkward, you know? And you start asking questions and engage, right? Hey, sir, is everything okay? Is this all right? However that looks. So he's reading the, he's reading the word. He's going to find him in Isaiah, right? Then I'm going to go down to verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, began with the scripture, told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he <laughs> commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when he came out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more. Can you imagine being that eunuch? Like Philip baptized him. All of a sudden, Philip's like, gone. Is that cool? Is that, is that cool, right? Now Philip's, Philip's going to end up in a whole other realm and how that happened. I was driving down the 40 freeway, and this lady, you know, it's bumper to bumper, 5 o'clock. You've all been on the 40 at 5 o'clock. You know what I mean? Causes you to pray in tongues or patience. And I'm, I'm there, and this lady, this older lady is on the side of the road. She hits her gas, and she's going to T-bone me. She's like, I'm like, and why is it everything goes slow motion? I'm like, no. And I'm like, brace myself. And the next thing I know, my car went from here ahead. I went ahead because there's a semi truck here. I have nowhere to turn. There's two other cars in front of me. And I'm like, oh, no. And the next thing I know, I'm ahead of the semi truck, my, my Tundra. And I got this guy next to me. He's like, what was that? I'm like, I don't know. I just thought it was weird. Okay, it was a weird story. Okay. So I, 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 I'm getting somewhere here with this. We're talking about these doctrines, right? Matthew 10, 1. And Jesus called the 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out to heal every kind of affliction and every kind of disease. Newsflash. In this empowerment of laying on their hands, God has given you authority. He doesn't say in this, he doesn't say pray for the sick. What does he say? Heal the sick. He, you have that authority. So what's your attitude? Like, Lord, if this is your will, I just pray that this happens. No, in the name of Jesus, rise up and pick up your pallet. Right? It's Paul, this is how Paul tells us to preach. Romans 15, 17. In Christ Jesus, then I, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. So what is Paul saying? When I went to the Gentiles, I came with a word and deed. What is the, verse 19 is going to tell you? By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, which would be Albania, I fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. What is Paul saying on this? Paul is saying, listen, church, like we are in a weird period of time. Anybody watch the opening of last night's Olympics? Woo! Like, crazy are you with me on that absolute blasphemy why would you have the lord's like the picture of leonardo da vinci's uh, last supper and have drag queens with little kids doing that are you with me if you haven't seen this kind of out in the news it was a little bit shocking i had people like well it was just art the context is the olympic games 
So I haven't seen that. I thought I'd thought I address that to you today because it was a little bit shocking. Like, why would you have drag queens mocking Jesus in the Last Supper? Hey, newsflash, like things are starting to ramp up. Things that used to be undercover are starting to come to the forefront. Completely inappropriate. It was an artistic thing. I don't get it. I'm more autistic than artistic, okay? Right? I, I didn't get that, right? So on behalf of those who feel that was art, I thought it was a mockery and a degradation of Christianity. That you would mock Jesus as a, as a fat drag queen. Sorry, no offense, but that's what they portrayed Jesus as. And they had a little girl up there. And I'm not going to go over what else it had, but that to me is like a sign of the times that we're in. Now, there was a time, I remember 50 years ago, being saved in the Jesus movement, where we'd say, Jesus is coming back soon. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, if the Olympics can promote that, I think Jesus is coming back soon. And when he comes back, he's going to be looking for a church that's without spot or wrinkle and seen as believing. And what do I mean by that? I can argue theology all day. I can argue on apologetics and have pretty good reasons for my, my faith. I have reasons to believe. But sometimes seeing is believing. And Paul saying, when I went to these cultures, it was by word and a demonstration of the power of God. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming back to the book of Acts. We are coming back to that period of time where most of the world didn't know who he was. But Paul demonstrated who he was. Like, well, Nick, that's not me, but it could be, okay? So he's saying that that's what happens to him. And, and so how does this happen? Let me, I'm all over my notes as usual, okay? Hunger brings his presence. Hunger. And so let me talk about hunger real quick, okay? Hunger is a craving or a discontent for more. And you're not satisfied by, by what you have. So let me put it in a context like this. Have you ever been by somebody's house and you know that you're not welcome in that house? Is that awkward? Is it like awkward? Like, like, I know you don't like me. Why am I here? Like, you don't want to be with me. This is really awkward, okay? Imagine being the Holy Spirit with a group of people like, we're more concerned about what time we get out. We're more concerned about our time and anything else like that than really being with you. Is that a place like you'd like to be? Because the Holy Spirit's a person. Holy Spirit is like, I don't care how late we're here. I, li I just like being with you. Isn't that what you get with friends? See, this is your passion. Like, it can be 1 o'clock in the morning, and you're starting to ride the bull. What do I mean by ride the bull? <laughs> My undergraduate is I have a business degree from University of Southern California, right, in business marketing. And uh, as a business major, Bachelor of Science, you actually had to take a science class. So I'm looking around, talking to all my fraternity brothers, what is the easiest science class to take? Because I am not wired that way. So it was between organic chemistry, no, <laughs> or earthquakes. And so I'm like, I'm going to take a class on earthquakes. And so there's 300 undergraduate students, and I'm sitting in the front row because this professor was like really boring. Eight o'clock in the morning, and he's talking, and now I'm going to talk about tectonic plate movements. <laughs> and I, I swear, you know when you're falling asleep and you're like, ah, you're, you're opening your eyes up, you're like, ah. And I started riding the bull. You know what riding the bull is? Is where you fall asleep and you're like, ha, 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 ha. And I'm riding the bull, man. I'm like, ha, 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 ha. Pre-laptop days, okay? So you actually had like, you had to take notes, not on like that, but notes. And I hear somebody snoring. I hear somebody snoring. <laughs> and I realize it was me. <laughs> and I tried to be cool, but my hand is like this on my desk. And I came up and I had a big drooly cooking. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, like, what is he talking about? And I, but this true story, I see a blue, like, like, I had a blue, like, big pin, and the blue big pin was like, <laughs> like that. And so I'm like, and so now I pick up my pen, I'm trying to be cool, I'm taking notes, and I'm like, what is he talking about? And I look, I'm like, oh, no. I slept all throughout my class, and I'm in the middle of another class. <laughs> and it's an undergrad class, like 300 people in the class. I'm like, oh, no, this isn't good. <laughs> Maybe my, nobody noticed <laughs> the guy snoring would drool. <laughs> so I take my books, I put them in my book bag, and I get up, and I'm going to be like on the deal. I'm going to snuck out. Everybody's like, yeah. <laughs> People like Kevin like, dude, you're that guy sleeping in that earthquake class, man. I'm like, I know, right? <laughs> Hunger is like when you're starting to nod off. 
you're starting to nod off. You know, it's like 1 o'clock in the morning. You're talking to friends. And all of a sudden, they start talking about something that you're interested in. And you go from like, yeah. And that's passion. And your passion determines the depth and the availability. The passion with the Holy Spirit when you've tasted and seen. You, you, you come to that place of like the Song of Solomon. Like, hey, 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 have you seen the one who my soul loves? Like, I want to be with him again. Like, I want to be with him again. I want, like, I, we, I, in the clefts of rocks, there's hiding. Like, when can we meet again? I want that so bad. And that was what brings revival. It's that heart of like, oh, my gosh, we're here. It's Saturday. Church is boring. But maybe God's saying, hey, yeah, I want to show up too, but I don't feel welcome. I'm not implying this to you guys because you guys are here on a Saturday night. You're hungry. But what would it look like if Raleigh, because Raleigh hasn't had a move of God really like historically since 1907. There was a, they called it the Azusa of the South. It happened in Dunn, Dunn, North Carolina, right? And I believe the Lord ain't done in Raleigh. <laughs> I believe the Lord has brought us together. I believe the Lord is stirring tribes of people who are like, hey, Lord, when can we meet again? Because hunger is an invitation of like, hey, I love you, and, and you love me, and I want to be around people that are hungry for more. They're not content of like, well, you know, I got saved and that was it. <laughs> That's why Jesus never preached the gospel of reconciliation or salvation. I've asked Jesus into my heart. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. That's in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 10. What's the difference between the gospel of reconciliation and the gospel, and the gospel of the kingdom? The gospel of reconciliation, this is the American church. Say the prayer and that's it. I'm saved. Now what? And the gospel of the kingdom says this, where there's a kingdom, there's a king. The king has domain. That's a kingdom. We don't understand kingdoms because we don't have kings. So you go to Thailand every day at 3 o'clock. Everybody stops. They, 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 they stop there and they sing, and long live the king, long live the king. I don't know what song they sing, but they, they sing. <laughs> I, it's in Thai. I have no idea what they're saying. Oh, I like the wall. Can you go the king? <laughs> I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> and they teach you this as missionaries. This is a YWAP thing. Because they'll ask you, they'll go through this and they'll go, hey, you know, like, like a couple of years ago in Bangkok, the king's soldiers opened up fire on, killed 3,000 innocent civilians, and the king gave approval of that. What do you think of the king? Your response had better be, the king is a good man. If you go to places in, in Thailand, like Phuket, like we've done sex trafficking stuff there and, and helping out. But in two blocks, there's 3,000 prostitutes. It, it, it's overwhelming, okay? And if, if somebody comes up and you goes, you know, the king approves of all these, all these prostitutes going on here and the sex tra traffic and all that. It's part of their culture. What do you think of the king? Your answer, it better be, the king is a good man. Why? Because where there's a king, he has domain. And to say anything derogatory against the king of, of Thailand is a 60-year jail sentence. What do you guys think of the king? You guys are like ninja learners, man. <laughs> King's a good man. Because <laughs> Jesus' message is, is he's king. And where he's king, he's Lord. And where he's Lord and king, it's not, Father, not my will, not my will, not my will. But, Lord, let your will be done. Father, not what I want, Lord God, but what do you want? And we understand his king, his kingdom, and him as king, and him as Lord. We come before him, I like, okay, I'm saved, I'm coming in. But Jesus, you asked us to be in this place, that your kingdom, when Jesus teaches how to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, Lord, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come to Raleigh. Let your kingdom come to Raleigh. And let your will be done in Raleigh. Amen. So anyways, I went way too long, too, told way too many stories, and there's a whole lot of other notes there that I'm not going to do, so, because it is Saturday. <laughs> but I want to do this. I don't know how I'm going to end this up, but we got our prayer ministry team. We have prayer people come up. If you want to be prayer, part of a prayer team, talk to, talk to Debbie Lipstone. And where's Stephen? Stephen, come on up and do the thing you do. Stephen, you're so amazing. We love you, man. And so, Father, I want to pray right now. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm going to pray this, that the more of God comes upon us right now. 
And what do I mean by the more of God? Like hunger. I came in here today and I, I, I was feeling like a little dismayed. N nothing against you guys. I was just feeling overwhelmed by everything that was happening in culture, right? And, and I'm like, Lord, this is 